Welcome everyone to this week's edition of Fair Territory. We've got a fun show planned for you today. We are going to start off talking about one of my favorite things in baseball, one of my favorite events of the year. I didn't go this year because I had other things going on, but I want to discuss the BBWAA dinner that took place Saturday night in New York City. Again, it is a gathering unlike any other. All of the award winners are there. MVPs, Cy Youngs, Managers of the Year, Rookies of the Year. And it's just a unique and special night that is put on by the New York chapter of the BBWAA. This year, Tim Healy was the chapter chairman. Mark Feinstein was very involved. Joel Sherman's always a big part of what goes on. And it is a massive organizational effort. It is a really big undertaking to get everybody into New York City in the middle of winter to gather in this hotel ballroom. It's an event that is open to the public. You can buy tickets and go. People do all the time. That's part of the magic of it. There's probably a thousand people in that ballroom. But again, they show videos. They have other awards as well. Some New York people are honored. Some others are honored. There are all kinds of awards that are given out. And it's just a really cool, cool event. So I want to show you two things that happened this year. Maybe talk about a few others. I want to start off with Shohei Otani's speech or a clip from it. And what is notable about this speech, just as it was when he won the MVP the first time, is that he spoke entirely in English. Now, Shohei Otani, like a lot of Japanese players and frankly, a lot of players from Latin American countries, has a good understanding of English. Actually, he has an excellent understanding of English. When I interviewed him twice for Fox during the WBC, as I was asking the questions to his interpreter, Ipe, Otani was nodding along. He knew exactly what I was saying, but a lot of players who aren't born in the U.S. just prefer to use the interpreter because they're more comfortable that way. So anyway, here's Otani accepting his MVP. So a uh, deep appreciation goes out to all of you that voted for me to win this uh, AL MVP award. To my fellow recipients, congratulations to all of you that and the uh, years you had. And for some of you up here, the cadets you had. To the Angels organization, ownership, front office, and the entire staff, thank you for the past six years. I always appreciated your support and allowing me the opportunity to play, with, to play this game I'm so passionate about. Again, there's Otani speaking to a ballroom of maybe a thousand people or so, maybe more, I don't even know. And he handled that beautifully, just as he did a few years back when he won his first MVP. And again, that's not easy. Think about speaking your second language in front of all of those people. That's something that takes some guts. And he did it. He pulled it off beautifully as he did the first time he won MVP as well. And there was one other moment that when I talked with Mark Feinsand about the dinner last night, he mentioned to me as really special. And this was an award that the BBWAA gave called the You Gotta Have Heart Award. You Gotta Have Heart, of course, is a very famous song from the musical Damn Yankees. And it's an award that is presented annually to someone who, frankly, has shown a lot of heart. And this year, that award went to Diamondbacks general manager Mike Hazen. And not because the Diamondbacks made the World Series, no. Because a few years back, in August of 2022, Mike lost his wife, Nicole, to a rare and aggressive form of brain cancer known as geoblastoma. It's an awful disease. Nicole fought it for two years, just about two years. And Mike and Nicole, they had four sons. So Mike was left to be essentially a single parent to four boys. And he is someone who is deeply respected in the game, very well liked, very popular. Theo Epstein, his former boss in Boston, introduced him. And here's part of what Mike had to say. I realize I'm not alone in having to deal with the sudden onset of sickness and the death of a spouse. And certainly not alone when it comes to cancer and glioblastoma, which to date still has no known cure. We're still talking about prolonging lives in months, not in years. And that should not be the fate of anyone that's stricken with this brain tumor. Now Mike Hazen has been fairly open about 
what happened with his wife and the whole process they went through. There was a beautiful article written in the Washington Post by Zach Buchanan during the World Series. And Mike has said, and he said it even in his speech, that he wants people to remember Nicole. It was important for her not to be forgotten. And she will always be remembered. There's a foundation in her honor, and there are all kinds of things that people do to put forward the memory of Nicole Hazen. And there were other highlights as well in this dinner of former Yankees Cy Young Award winner Ron Guidry introduced the current Yankees Cy Young Award winner Garrett Cole. There was also a speech by Dusty Baker at the end of the night. And again, this is a night that just gets everyone excited for baseball. Spring training is almost here. You have all the award winners in one place. You have all these other awards being given out. It's something special. And you can see from the two speeches or the clips we've shown how unique the night is. We rarely get to see these baseball people speaking in public the way they do at this event. Okay, on to the business of baseball. The offseason continues. Signings taking place. Some good ones in recent days, or interesting ones, I should say. Jock Peterson to the Diamondbacks, Adam Ottavino to the Mets, the Tigers signing of Colt Keith, an infielder who has yet to play a game in the major leagues, signed one of those pre-debut extensions. And then there's the one that I want to talk about a little bit here. It's the one I wrote about a couple of days ago. It involves Hector Neris, who signed with the Cubs one year, $9 million. Now, Hector Neris last year had a 1.71 ERA as a reliever. It was his third consecutive season of 70 or more appearances. So my expectation, and I think the expectation of the average fan, was that he would get a multi-year deal. He'd do pretty well. And there was some talk in the media. There were some things written and printed. He was looking for two years. He was looking for three years. Sometimes some of these things are accurate. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they lead people to have a false sense of what actually might happen. And in Neris's case... As I wrote, one year probably was appropriate. Now, the relief market has been robust this season. And David Robertson, a pitcher who is four years older than Neris, he's 39, Neris is 35. Robertson got more money than Neris, $2.5 million more, even though Robertson didn't really finish the year strongly at all for the Marlins. He got removed from the closers role. While Neris, he was trusted in huge moments for the Astros, pitching in the ALCS five of the seven games. So let's start off with an explanation of why this happened. Let's start off talking about the contracts themselves because the numbers here don't tell the entire story. And let's take a look for those watching on YouTube, and I'll show you what I mean here. So Neris, yes, one year, $9 million with the Cubs. Robertson, one year, $11.5 million with the Rangers. But the Neris deal includes a club option for a second season that can turn into a $9 million player option if he makes 60 appearances. And again, he's made 70 or more in each of his last three seasons. Now, Robertson's breakdown has a $5 million salary for this year, a $1.5 million buyout on a mutual option, and then $5 million deferred, $1 million each year, from 2027 to 2031. And the deferred money, as I know fans have come to understand with the Shohei Otani contract and others over the years, that lowers the present day value of the deal. So in some ways, Neris's deal is better than Robertson's, or at least comparable. The other part of this is the way they performed last year. And the big thing, the big thing I think that hurt Neris is that his velocity dropped, dropped from 94.3 miles per hour in 2022 to 93 miles per hour in 2023. That's a drop in average fastball velocity of nearly one and a half miles per hour. For teams that are looking for future performance and trying to figure out in free agency which guys can be as good as they want them to be going forward, that obviously is significant. And I'll show you one other thing as well here in the comparison just between Neris and Robertson. Neris, while he had the showy ERA, his expected numbers weren't quite as sexy. And you can see his expected ERA was 3.33, actually higher than Robertson's expected ERA, even though Robertson had the higher actual ERA. So all of these things come into play, and you put it together, put it all together, and you can understand why Neris received the deal he did and why I said again, 
that probably this ended up in the right place. Time now for the inside dish. This is the part of the show where I go inside a story I've written, inside something going on in the game, or maybe go off the board entirely. But today I want to talk about a column that I published on Monday and the headline of the column, why I remain skeptical about the A's grandiose Vegas plans. Now, obviously I've written about the A's before, but there have been some things recently that I've learned or thought about that I kind of wanted to explore again. And this column, kind of the genesis of it for me was when I started thinking about the idea that the A's are going to play the 2025 to 2027 seasons, three years, in a place that right now is undetermined. They've got one more year in Oakland, the final year of their lease there. They moved to Vegas, the new stadium, in 28. So there are three years in the interim that are not yet accounted for and will be accounted for. And my first thought here was, has this ever happened in baseball? And the answer is no. There's never been a team play three years in a city that is not its home. The last time it happened in baseball was nearly a century and a half ago. It was the Hartford Dark Blues. They played one season in Brooklyn, only one. They played one game in Hartford that year, but then they moved back to Hartford. Now, when a team relocates, it's quite common for it to play in a ballpark in its new city that isn't necessarily its new park. The Nationals are a great example of that. Three years at RFK Stadium while they were waiting for Nationals Park to be built. But the A's are not going to do that. They're not most likely going to be playing in Las Vegas, though that is one of the options. Summer Lynn, Nevada, the home of their AAA team. But they're talking about Sacramento. They're talking about Salt Lake City. They're also talking about Oracle Park in San Francisco. And here is the interesting catch here, as first reported by the San Francisco Chronicle. For the A's to keep collecting their money from NBC Sports California, their regional television sports network, they've got to stay in the Bay Area, and no, Sacramento doesn't count. So that's one incentive for them to stay at Oracle. It might even be an incentive for them to stay in Oakland, as crazy as an idea as that sounds. That contract paid the A's $67 million last year. And as I wrote, you think John Fisher's walking away from $67 million easily based on all we know about him since he took over as owner in 2005? Uh, I don't think he's walking away so easily. The other part of this, or there are two other parts that are interesting to me here. So the A's, like any team moving into a new ballpark, plan to ramp up their payroll, ramp up as they go forward and prepare to have their permanent relocation. Well, the figures I reported in this column, figures I received from a source with knowledge of the situation, he said that the A's plan is to have payrolls of $130 million to $150 million leading up to the permanent relocation to Vegas. So wherever they are, they're going to ramp it up to $130 to $150, probably, I don't know, $26, $27, 28 in that range. And then once they get there, $170 million plus. Now, this is problematic as well. The A's, first of all, have never spent more than $92 million under John Fisher. He took over in 2005. That's their highest payroll. They are suddenly going to change their whole business model. That's the premise here. The whole thing is changing. Okay, let's assume that that is the case. It has to be the case. That's the plan they presented, essentially, to Major League Baseball to get the votes that they needed. Okay. They're going to attract free agents when they're playing in Sacramento or Summerlin or Oracle Park. Or, I don't know. Maybe they will. Maybe they'll spend enough money and players won't care. But the other part of this is John Fisher will be spending a lot of money before he gets into the new park where the revenues are expected to be much greater. He's going to engage in deficit spending. John Fisher, based on all we know about him, I don't know about that. And finally is Vegas itself the 40th largest TV market in the country. 40th. They'll be the smallest in baseball once the A's get there. So if you're going to play in that smaller media market and have lower revenues because of that from your local TV and media contracts, you're going to need to draw people. You're going to need to have very strong attendance. 
Well, the A's plan is, yes, we can do that because of the tourism industry in Vegas and because the local population has shown definitely support for the two professional franchises that are there right now, the NHL's Golden Knights and the NFL Raiders. Well, that's not apples to apples, first of all. And second of all, if you want to have strong attendance, if you're going to build this robust fan base, you better put a competitive team on the field. And that's where it goes back to the need to spend money. And I talked to team president Dave Cavill for this column, and he said, yes, it is necessary for us to be competitive, to enact the plan that we want to. Again, this is John Fisher, his owner. He's going to do all this. Now, maybe all this will happen. The A's have their projections. They have their plans. They seemingly have it all figured out, at least in their own heads. But past performance is an indicator of future performance. Is it not? We hear that all the time in television ads, right? So in summing all of this up, in considering the A's history under Fisher, in considering the future, I'll just put it this way. And this is how I wrote it in the column. I'll believe it when I see it. Time now for the Dude and Dork of the Week. Actually, this week, it's Dudes of the Week. There are three Dudes of the Week, and you know who they are. They're the dudes who were elected to the Hall of Fame just last week. I'm talking about Adrian Beltre and Joe Maurer and Todd Helton. I voted for all three. I've made the case for all three. I believe all three are entirely worthy. They are the dudes of the week. They will elevate the Hall of Fame by their presence. And I feel sorry for Billy Wagner. I voted for him as well. He fell five votes short. He's got one more year of eligibility, and hopefully next year we'll have him not only in the Hall of Fame, but as our Dude of the Week in 2025 at this time of year, along with a few others. The Hall of Fame, the announcement day, is just a great day in the sport. This one, because it produced multiple Hall of Famers, was especially lively and especially meaningful. Congratulations to all three guys, Adrian Beltre, Todd Helton, Joe Maurer. Dorks of the week, and I imagine some fans might object to this. I imagine some people might say, Ken, you're being too easy on your brethren. But I'm going to give the dorks of the week, it's multiple, it's plural, to all of the people who vote shame, who go all crazy when they see a vote for Brandon Phillips. Okay, I can't figure that one out either. When they see 19 people don't vote for Adrian Beltre, when they see an obvious Hall of Famer, I'm thinking about Ichiro next year, when they see that guy is not unanimous. Now, the voting body this year consisted of 385 members of the BBWAA that earned the right to vote through 10 years of covering the sport. That's what you have to do. You have to cover the sport for 10 years. Now, as with any group of 385 people, you're not going to have, or you're rarely going to have, unanimous opinion. You're always going to have a few people that, let's face it, are out there. Okay, we have that every year, but by and large, the vote ends up what the vote should end up being. The social media shaming that happens, not so much this year, but in the past, and I'm expecting in the future, I just think it's tired. And it's unnecessary. And actually, though I know it's not going to ever end, and I get that, free country for people who dissent on this point as well, I really don't care for it very much. Time now for Grilling Ken. I believe we're going to start with another Hall of Fame question. We've had a few in the past few weeks and always happy to answer these. Let's go to the questions. First one comes from Diana, the easy lover. She asks, in an area of pitchers being on shorter leashes and more scrutiny, what will the new standard be for a Hall of Fame pitcher? This is an excellent question. And a lot of us have written about this. The idea that a pitcher is going to win 300 games again is probably far-fetched. We might see it happen once or twice, but that standard, which has always been the standard, along with 3,000 hits and 500 home runs, generally automatic induction for players that reach those standards, that's changed. It's changed because of the way pitchers are used today. So if it's not 300, then what is the standard? Well, it probably isn't an obvious one. For one thing, we don't take wins or assign the same value to wins that we once did. So even if you say, okay, 200 wins is now the standard, 250, we look at other things. We look at war, we look at ERA, we look at adjusted ERA, we look at strikeout rates, all kinds of factors go into whether you vote for a pitcher or not. 
So I expect that in future years, both for pitchers and position players, we're going to take a harder look at the peaks, the seven-year peaks that Jay Jaffe speaks of when he writes for Fangraphs and he uses in his Jaws formula, and just the shorter peaks in general and what players accomplish in those windows. I still prefer 10 years of dominance, but 10 years of dominance today has a different meaning than 10 years of dominance, say, in the 1960s or 70s or even the 90s. So yes, the standards, if you want to call them that, will change. I don't know that we'll have set criteria. We never really have, but certainly we will look at things differently going forward. All right, the next question comes from the Mariner Mile, and the Mariner Mile asks, any truth to the rumors around the Mariners trading one of their young pitchers? This could have been asked, I don't know, six months ago, 12 months ago. We've been talking about this for a while. The two pitchers in question are Bryce Miller and Brian Wu. They are the Mariners' fourth and fifth starters, I guess, in their current alignment. And they are guys who, because of the demand for starting pitching, would fetch quite a haul because of all their years of club control remaining. And Bob Nightingale wrote over the weekend that the Mariners have shown interest in Dylan Cease. It would take Brian Wu or Bryce Miller to get Dylan Cease, among other things. And that's why I'm sure the question is coming up again. The Mariners under Jerry DePoto are never close-minded on any front. They will entertain any and all possibilities. But it seems to me their greater need right now is offense. And by trading Robbie Ray and even Marco Gonzalez, what they try to do is shift their future financial burden more to the offensive side, or at least balance it out better. That's a better way of putting it, balance it out. This offseason, they've lost Eugenio Suarez, Jared Kelenic, Teo Hernandez. They've added Mitch Garver, Mitch Hanniger, who's often hurt, Luis Urias, Luke Raley, Sebi Zavala. In my view, they still need offense. Now, if they can get Dylan Cease for a reasonable price, be my guest. Go ahead. You put Luis Castillo and Dylan Cease together, that's a pretty formidable top of the rotation. But in my view, this team still needs offense more than anything else. All right. The final question this week comes from Stanley, Southside Stan, who asks, with O'Neill Cruz changing agents to the same one as Brian Reynolds, we're talking about CAA, does this mean a long-term contract is about to be signed? Wishful thinking, I'm sure, if you're a Pirates fan, and certainly it's possible O'Neill Cruz at some point will sign an extension. But I would expect, for one thing, the Pirates are going to want to see more. They're going to want to see O'Neill Cruz on the field and doing his thing before they can figure out what his value going forward is. They've seen plenty, and you can say, well, Ken, the Tigers just signed Cole Keith and the Brewers signed Jackson Churio, and they have no idea what these guys are going to be. But if I'm the Pirates, I'm maybe exercising a little bit of caution there. The other part of this is Brian Reynolds, I believe, was a year away from free agency when he signed his extension. O'Neill Cruz is much further away. They're entirely different situations. The one thing you can say here is that CAA, certainly as an agency, has shown that it will sign extensions for young players. They will do that at times. But I don't know that one thing leads to another. I want to thank everyone for all their questions. They're always great questions. I appreciate you guys reaching out on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. I want to thank everyone for watching and listening on YouTube, Apple, Spotify. You know where to find us. You like us, subscribe to us, stay with us. We'll be back next week. Have a great week, everyone. We've got a new offer for the FT fam with the same bonus code FOUL, F-O-U-L. Bet $5, get $158 instantly. Place your first BetMGM Sportsbook wager through the BetMGM Sportsbook app of at least $5, and you'll receive $158 instantly in additional winnings regardless of your wager's outcome. Download the BetMGM Sportsbook app, sign up and deposit at least $5 into your newly created account, Place a wager in the amount of at least $5 at standard odds price. And once you've placed a bet, you'll receive $158 in bonus bets, regardless of the outcome of your wager. Again, that's bonus code FOUL, F-O-U-L. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER.